Thank you so much for being here. Um, and I'm looking forward to presenting this, the three main e-commerce flow, email flows that every e-com brand needs. So a little bit about me first. I'm Hannah. I'm an email strategist and conversion copywriter. And I run a micro agency where I help e-com brands grow their revenue with email. Okay. Now, we often see if you read the screen, you have all these sayings as if like email marketing has an ROI of $42 for every dollar spent. Email marketing is so powerful. Email is the only platform you own. And all of this is 100% true, right? The thing is that it's only true if we make it true. It's only true if the emails that we write or the emails that we send out are actually the emails that are going to bring the ROI. You can't just send a templated email out and expect it to bring in the ROI. You can't expect powerful emails um, when they're not powerful, right? So we need to make sure that our emails are doing what they, they that we want them to do. We have to make sure that they're strategic and only then do they reach these goals. So my goal today is to show you how to do that. Now, it really, before I go into the actual nitty gritty of the different sequences that you want and that you need, it really boils down to this one thing that is essentially custom experience. What do I mean by that? Um, if we, as, as people who are writing those emails or sending those emails, remember that there's actually a customer on the other side of the screen. And there's actually, a, even not a customer, even a person, a subscriber, an audience, someone, a real live human, just like you, just like me. Not not just like that you're sending out emails into the cyberspace. No, you're sending it to an actual person who's going to open this email. And if you have that in mind, then it puts things into context for every email you're going to write. Because you're not just writing into nowhere. You're writing to a person, to a single person who's going to read this email. And if you have that in mind, already your shift, already the way you're going to write, already the emails you're going to send are going to be different. So that's always stage one, focus one. Now, what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about welcome sequence, we're going to talk about the abandoned cart sequence, and we're going to discuss the post-purchase sequence. These are the three critical emails that every e-com brand needs. Yes, there are a lot of other sequences that e-com brands should be doing, but these are the most critical sequences. So we're going to start with these three. Okay, the first one is a welcome sequence. Now that's the most weighty sequence because like it's written here, it's often your new subscriber's very first email touch point and it kind of sets the tone for your entire future email relationship. They know, they, they're kind of going to expect, based on that first those first emails, they're going to start expecting a certain type of email from you. So it really is important to set the stage of what you, what they can expect from you, what they should be looking out for and all of that. You know how they say first impressions count? So this is kind of where the with a welcome sequence. First impressions really do count and you want to make sure you're getting it right. Now, I want to cover the three main purposes of welcome sequence. First of all, you want to connect with your subscribers. Going back to what I said before, um, where I said that customer experience above all really ties into this because the people reading your emails are human. So you want to make sure that every email is written to a human and so you can connect with them. So that means, and you can see this list here, I'll go through them quickly. First of all, you want to write like you would to a friend. So sometimes you see emails written that nobody would ever write to a friend. It's like written as if, I don't know what you know century you're from, but this is not how people write. You want to write like you would literally to a friend. That also means, that, like the second one, no stuffy language or jargon. Don't use words that nobody uses. Don't use terminology that is never really understood or is just used in the written word to sound professional because it doesn't come across as professional. It comes across as not a brand that I can connect to. Now, your email should come from a person. So I'm giving you an example here. Instead of having the, the from name be Green Frog or even the actual email be Green Frog, it should be Jennifer at Green Frog. And in this from name, you could have Jennifer slash Green Frog or Jennifer um, at Green Frog, you know, with, either with this sign or with the AT, whatever it is. But the reason that is so... The reason that's more, that, that's more advisable is because, again, it, it's written to a human from a human. So you want that connection. You want that, that name in there, not just the company name. Next one is don't write in proper case because when you write in proper case, you see this example over here, it looks, um, I don't have to say it, but nobody really writes like that. So yeah, you might find it as headers on blog posts, but not on email. Write it simple, like I'm writing the rest, easy to read. Um, avoid boring subject lines. So yeah, now, this is obviously very, you know, broad, avoid boring subject lines, right? But 
if you think of it like this, a boring subject line means that nobody's going to read the email. Even if the email is the best email that you've ever written, if it's a boring subject line or irrelevant subject line, no one's going to actually read it. And then it's a shame because the email is a waste. So you have to have subject lines that are curiosity inducing, they're relevant, they're interesting. Now, I know that that's hard to say, to see, um, but it's important to have these subject lines so that people open it. And if you need more help with this kind of thing, with the subject lines, I actually have a resource on my site, a free resource. You can check it out. I'll put my site link later and you can see that. That might help you come up with good subject lines. Um, and then the last one, don't use 16 call to actions. Now, I know that that might be a bit of an over-exaggeration, but sometimes, you know, you'd be surprised. You open an email from a company and you see things like subscribe now, uh, reply to us, forward to a friend, um, buy from us, shop now, follow us on Instagram, uh, all these things. And, and when you see all these things, what happens is the brand is thinking, you know, I want them to do all these things. But what happens to a regular, normal person when you see all these call to actions? Usually it's like analysis paralysis. I, I, I don't know what you want me to do first, so I'm just not going to do any. I'm just going to close out the email. Bye-bye. Which is a shame. Pick the one thing you want them to do. Obviously, every email could be different. One email could be subscribe. One email could be buying. One email could be referring to a friend, anything like that. But you want to make sure you have the same call to action. You can use the same call to action more than once, but not different call to actions. Okay, so that's my, there's obviously a lot more you can do to make your emails human, but these are just simple tips you can literally go into date into your backend and fix. Okay, next purpose of a welcome sequence is to build trust. Now, you want people to recognize you as the go-to brand in your industry. You want to inspire their loyalty. How do you do that? So I have three, this is just three simple ways to do that. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. But the idea is that people, regular normal people do things that other people do. So if you're going to give me a customer success story, and if you're going to give me a testimonial, and if you're going to give me a review of someone else, that is going to build trust because I'm going to see that, okay, if they've done it, then maybe I should do that as well. Or if they've purchased, then maybe I should purchase as well, right? So all of this is a great way to build yourself up as the one, as the brand in the industry. And then finally, the third purpose of a welcome sequence is to sell. By opting in, your new subscriber is showing interest in your brand, right? By, by giving you their email address, they're really asking you for updates. They're asking you for coupons. They want to know more and they're open to spending more with you, right? It's not like you're just sending uh, a promotion out the blue, um, which obviously you can do, but a welcome sequence means that they've asked for this email. They've asked to hear about you. So you can use this welcome sequence to sell on autopilot because they're interested in selling from you, from us uh, buying from you. Will everyone buy? No, but it really does give you permission to sell because they're asking it from you. So do that, sell, show them what you have, give them the ability to see what you have. Yes, you wanna show them why they should buy and you wanna show them the reasons they should buy from you and not someone else, but you don't have to shy away from selling. So that's the third purpose. Um, I just wanna go back again. We had three purposes of a welcome sequence. First of all, to connect with your subscribers by being human. The second one was to build trust. And then the third one is to sell. Now, before we move on to the next one, I do want to say that you want to, like I'm writing here, beware the big bad wolf. What do I mean when I say beware the big bad wolf? I mean, beware of discounts. So really, discount is a conversation for a whole different presentation. And I don't want to go too deeply into this because I know there's a lot of different thoughts on this. But I will say that you don't want to turn your brand and what you're offering into a discount fest. Sometimes you come for, uh, you sign up for an uh, email and they say, you know, sign up for our email, you get 10% discount. Now, sometimes it's fine. Sometimes that's what the brand should be doing to build themselves up, especially when they're a newer brand and they don't have that many subscribers. But you want to take a good hard look at if you're doing the right thing by offering a discount when somebody subscribes. You want to see maybe if there's different ways you can get people to subscribe without offering discounts. Why do I say this? Because we, we operate in very much of a discount-based um, marketing world where everything is discounts, discounts, discounts thrown at us. So what happens? I, I know for myself personally that there's some brands that I know that are always offering me discounts. So I'll never actually buy when there is no discount because why would I? Wait another two weeks, there's going to be another discount on my doorstep. So you want to make sure that you are not turning into a discount fest. You are not turning into a place where Customers are expecting discounts from you every single, you know, two, three weeks, every single national holiday, because then you're just going to damage the margins the rest of the year. 
So you want to be careful with discounts. I'm not going to go all out and say, don't do discounts ever, because I don't think that's smart because it is needed certain times. But you want to just know that, you know, a discount is something that you want to use with caution. Do you want to use it now? Is it serving your purpose now? And if not, you know, what else can you use instead? Even something, by the way, like free shipping could be more effective than a discount because it doesn't train your subscribers to wait for a discount. But there's a lot of other things you can do as well, like, um, you know, quizzes, um, other lead magnets, PDFs, things that people could really be interested in without shoving discounts at them the entire time. But let's leave that for now, because really, like I said, it's really a conversation for a different presentation. OK, I want to show you a sample outline of what a welcome sequence can look like. Again, this is not the one outline you should be using, but I just want to make it very practical for you. I want you to walk away with a sample outline that you can use. So first email, if you look at it from left to right, welcome and thanks for joining us. So you want to make your customers feel good about the decision and you want to make, prime us, tell us what's to come. Yeah, you want to tell us like what can we expect from you going forward. Next one, brand story. You want to tell us a little bit about how you started. Um, and bonus points to you if the email comes from the founder or the CEO. So like the name of the CEO at the company name, because again, it feels more um, human. It feels more relatable. Third one, differentiators. You want to show, tell us how you're different and you want to show us why you are not your competitor. And this is very important because often what happens is even if a person signs up to your um, to subscribe, they're often seeing other sites as well. So you want to really point that out well. Next one is social proof. You want to show me that I'm not alone. You want to show me that others have had success. Others are enjoying your product. Real reviews talk loud. And by the way, this is not a specific to the fourth email. You want to really sprinkle this liberally everywhere. Testimonials, reviews, stamps, credibility, all of that should be sprinkled everywhere. And finally, um, you want to address hesitations. Now, you might think this is counterintuitive and why should I address hesitations? But it's really not like that, because if you're addressing my hesitations and you're telling me, you know, I know this is bothering you about this, or I know this might be on the expensive side, or I know this is not something, you know, that you want to buy every single, whatever it is, whatever the hesitations are, you should know them. You want to address that. And it's a smart idea to do it because, yes, it's the elephant in the room, but that's going to help them get around it. Because if they don't have their uh, hesitations addressed, they're not going to buy. So you do want to do that, even if it's uncomfortable. These are the five emails I suggest. Um, obviously, a welcome sequence could and should be longer. I'm just giving you like basic five things you can do, go away today and input into your system so that you can have a head start on something. Okay, that was the welcome sequence. Let's talk about the abandoned cart sequence. We covered the welcome sequence. Welcome sequence, like we said, it's a, a sequence where we connect our subscribers, we sell, we build that trust and all of, and this is just your outline for it. Now we're going to do the abandoned cart sequence. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay. By its very nature, the sequence is what I call weird, right? Why? Because you know how you get these abandoned cart sequences in your inbox and they have like these little eye emojis and it kind of makes you feel like someone's looking over your shoulder to like see what you're doing um, and someone's following you. It has that little bit of like that cringe vibe, but I aim when I work with my clients and what I'm aiming for you to do is to unweirdify that. And yes, I did make up that word. So before I actually show you how we unweirdify that, some stats. 69% of online cards are abandoned by users. That's a crazy amount. You want to optimize your abandoned card flow to get back all those sales. Why? Because and not why, how? Because because and this is another really impressive statistic. 45% of the cart abandonment emails are opened. So these emails can really are, are getting read. You want to make sure that what's read is powerful enough to make them add to cart, go back to the cart and buy. So let's see. Now, the most common reasons why your shoppers abandon cart is not what you think. Most people think that is distraction. I got distracted. Um, the person was, I don't know, browsing. And then there was this like, um, interesting notification that came up. There was this meme that someone sent them. They had to check someone was knocking at the door, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's usually not the real reason. Yes, it could be distraction. It could. I'm not saying it could, but we always go with this like idea that yes, it's distraction. We get distracted. We're a distractible generation. True, true, and true, but not necessarily the reason why someone's abandoning car. Here's why. It's I can't decide. I'm on a site. I'm browsing. I'm looking through different options for 
I don't know, uh, furniture. Because that's quite a high-end product, but let's go with that. So I'm looking through the different furniture product options, and I'm not sure if I should buy it or not. And I added to cart because I like it, and I'm thinking I should get it. But I just can't make that final decision. I don't know what I should do. Let me maybe check with my partner. Let me maybe check with a friend. Let me do something about it. I'm not sure. So what happened is, it's just like that paralysis of I can't decide and not doing anything about it. And then I just leave. So maybe I get distracted or maybe I'm just purposely moving on to something else. But the reason is not because I got distracted. It's because I simply can't decide. And I'm using myself as a personal example here, but this happened in any different shape, way, shape or form. Um, now, if you want to recover that those lost sales, what happens is you need to actually coach your shopper through that indecision. So you need to say to them, like, you know, in the abandoned cart emails, you need to take them through that indecision, not just slam them with a discount, because that might not help even, right? Telling them, oh, you get a discount in the first email is not really solving their problem. They're not sure. They, they don't know. They're not 100% sure. They're not confident enough to take the next step. So what do you do? I'm going to show you. First of all, you need to meet the hesitations. What are the hesitations? Um, you need to address their concerns and you need to offer help. Only once you've taken them past the indecision, can you then sweeten the deal with a discount? Okay, so the discount is not anywhere near the first set of emails. First, we need to coach them past that indecision. How does it play out? I'm gonna show you. So this is a sample outline. Let's go from left to right. First email, again, note on the sample. This is what a traditional abandoned cart email, what I, a strategic abandoned cart sequence can look like. Obviously, it has to be plug and played with your specific store. Okay, one hour post abandonment. We're sending this email. Remind them that they've abandoned uh, uh, a cart and we want to tell them about the value in going back to it. And you want to offer any help if needed. So we're not yet pushing them with all the reasons they should buy because yes, it could be that they forgot. Yes, it could be that they were distracted. So we're giving them like this soft launch into it. Like you remind, you've abandoned the cart. Here's why it's a shame because you know this product is so amazing because of X, Y, Z. And if you need any help, because we know that purchasing could be a very big decision, you know, here's our help. Reach us at this phone number, this support desk this email, etc. And note over here, by the way, make it easy for them to reach out for you. Don't make it an entirely complicated way for them to get to you. An easy reply, an easy email, easy number, anything like that. And then next one is the 24 hours post abandonment. You want to handle, here's this is quite a hard hitting email. You want to handle any objections your audience has. Okay, so you need to know that. Now, this presentation isn't going to tell you how to know that because that's really context for another presentation. But you need to know the hesitations your audience has through research and you need to address that. It's important to address that because if something keeps coming up, like it's a very expensive product or it's a very hard to clean product or um, they're not sure if it's the right fit for them, you need to then walk them through why they should buy, even if it's expensive, why they should buy, even if it's a, a harder to clean product, why they should buy it, even et cetera, et cetera. You, they, you, they need to know the reasons why they should buy it, even if. Right? Again, we're coaching them through the I can't decide moment. And obviously, the I can't decide moment is based on something. So you need to know what that is and then coach them through it. Finally, here's where 48 hours post abandonment, here's where you can bring in a discount. Because if the previous two emails haven't worked, then and you haven't managed to actually coach them through that indecision, or you have managed, but they're not the right time for it, then, then switching the deal is a good idea. That said, you do want to add a deadline for urgency because you don't want someone coming back in six months' time and you know using that discount in six months later. You want to add a discount, a deadline, something like even a day or two days. You want to make it urgent. You want to get this. We're here for you. We want you to get this. Two days for the discount. Now, if you see the note at the bottom, for all three emails, you really want to liberally add in a social proof. Because again, like I mentioned in the welcome sequence, humans are driven by what others like them have done. So if we have it covered in social proof, like testimonials, like reviews, like success stories, things like that, um, you have a high chance of converting. So make sure you have that. Again, I want to mention that these three emails are a great starting point. Three emails is typical for an abandoned cart sequence. If you want to add another email, that's fine. If you want to add an email that you feel like is important for your brand, that's fine too. But the idea is this is the, your core sequence that you can run with and try. Okay. So that covers our abandoned cart sequence. Um, again, let me just run through the summary of it. We said that it's 
by its very nature, the sequence is weird, but we're going to unweirdify it by making it specific to the people by coaching them through the icon on the side moment. So then, like I said, you need to meet the hesitations, address concerns, offer help. And then this was your outline to coach you through exactly what you should be including in your abandoned cart sequence. Let's talk about the post-purchase sequence. Now, the abandoned cart sequence and the welcome sequence are both very ROI forward-facing sequences. They bring in a lot of ROI, it's great. Post-purchase sequence is not here to generate immediate sales. It's a forward, like I wrote, it's a forward-thinking sequence and it's where you nurture that bond between you and your newly acquired customer. Here's the thing, people open order confirmations and shipping updates, right? I'm sure you know from yourself, I personally always open it just to check that everything's in order. So you wanna use this opportunity carefully. Wasting it on a plane, you know, your order has shipped is a waste of space. I mean, you have to include that, but you wanna also use the space for the things that you can use to promote your brand. I don't mean selling, I mean just showing up as, some, as, as a brand that cares about your customer. Traditional post-purchase emails are yawn-inducing. And this is a space where you can stand out. Obviously, depending on your brand voice, if you have a quirky brand voice, if you have a fun brand voice, if you have a serious brand voice, it doesn't make a difference. But you use that to stand out. And I'm going to show you how you can make the most of each one. So let's go through it slowly. The first email in the post-purchase sequence is the order confirmation. The order confirmation emails have an open rate of 60%. Like I said, it's huge. The key thing you want to do here is not just say your order has, you know, we're confirming your order. You want to make a customer feel good about the purchase. Why? Because it's very normal to have buyer's remorse when you're shopping. I'm sure you know that when you shop, sometimes after you make a purchase, you instantly might regret it for just a second. You don't want your customers to feel that and you don't want them to like even act on that and, and ask for a refund straight away. You want to eradicate that. How do you do that? It's very much done by showing your customers that they've done the right thing, that they've purchased and that they've done a good, like it's a good decision that they've purchased. So you wanna have that warm, that encouraging messaging and that sets the tone for future purchases. That makes them feel good. Like, thank you for purchasing or, and having a warm message makes them feel good. And, and again, it sets the stage for future purchases, which is a good retention plan. I did. Okay, next email. This is something that obviously has to be, this is not a transactional post-purchase, this is a marketing post-purchase email, and it doesn't always work depending on what you're selling. But an idea, if you can do it, is the before it ships email. So it's a good opportunity to cross or upsell. And I would say do it gently because you don't want to come across as too um, harsh, but you can offer customers opportunity to add something to their order before shipping. So it could be based on their order, obviously give them relevant recommendations shown to them. Um, and you can tell them, you know, that you've purchased this and, you know, before it ships, do you want to add this, that, or the other? I do recommend going with gentle messaging just because they've already made that purchase. So you want to appreciate that and not kind of push it in their faces. Um, so keep it light, keep it focused. Third one, a shipping confirmation. As soon as the order shipped, you want to make sure that you let your customers know that. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many brands don't do that. And you want to provide a tracking number. And obviously you want to use this email to get them excited for their products to arrive. You want to like use the space to make them feel like, you know, something's coming, look out for it. Some brands do it really well. Some brands don't do it well. And again, it's not, doesn't, you can get by with such a shipping confirmation, but you, you might as well use it to build that excitement. Fourth email, how to use it. Um, so this is after, um, and I think we're missing a delivery confirmation here. I'm not sure why. But after the shipping confirmation, you should be having a delivery confirmation. You know, your order has been delivered. And, you know, we hope you enjoy. Let us know if you have any questions. Then you can have a how to use it email. And this is when it's arrived already, after it's delivered. So here's where you actually build the connection by showing that it's not all about the purchase, right? We actually care about the product and you, and we want you to use it well. So depending on what it is, you can offer care instructions, you can offer tutorials on how to use it, you can offer usage guidance, whatever it is, obviously some things will need more, some things will need less. But anything could use, you know, uh, how to use this product. And that really makes the client, the customer feel like you're, you're, you know, you're here to help them. Finally, a review request. Customer reviews, as I'm sure you all know, are gold, and you want to get as many as you can. So the timing is very important here because I don't know about you, but I've definitely received like review requests before I've even purchased it, which is silly. 
um, and I'm not going to go back to it later. And you also want to make sure it, you, you're sending the review request, even if it's obviously you want to send it afterwards, but you want to make sure you're sending it at the right time. So for home decor, you'd have to wait a week or two or even more. But if you're selling a protein shake, you know, something that's going to be consumed right afterwards, then you can send it a couple of days later. You have to like, just use that common sense of when is the best time to send it. Now, you want to make it easy because I'm telling you right now that nobody's going to fill out a review or, 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 or you know, um, uh, what's it called, or, or write a review if it's impossible to find, if the links are difficult, if they can't do it straight away, make it easy. Easy instructions, one link, and then you have a higher chance of getting that review. Okay, those are the basic emails you need for post purchase. Obviously, again, you can fill it out more or less, but those are the basic emails you need. And I want you to remember with the post purchase sequence, customer experience, and I'm coming back to what I said right at the beginning, customer experience is really above all. Again, the people that have purchased your products are not just subscribers, they're customers. So you want to offer with every email, you want to offer support, assistance, help. And make it easy for them to reach you. Let customers know that you're easy to reach and that you're happy to help. And that in itself is a huge retention uh, scheme that somehow brands fail to forget. They pour so much money into marketing and pour so much money into getting people through the door that they fail to realize that having... Uh, customer experience and having customer support, strong customer support and strong customer experience can be your biggest retention plan. And that covers it all. We spoke about the welcome sequence, where we spoke about how we connect, how we build trust and how we sell. We spoke about the abandoned cart sequence, where we aim to win back sales. And then we spoke about the post-purchase sequence, where we're nurturing that bond between you and your customer. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer those. Um, I'd be more than happy to chat. If you have them now, you could do that now. If not, you could email them to me later. My email's in the corner of the screen. And like I said at the beginning, I do have a resource on my site to help you write interesting subject lines. Um, if you go to the site link over here, and if you scroll down right to the bottom, you'll find, uh, you'll find uh, it says over there that if you want a, a PDF where you can download subject lines that will that are curiosity inducing that are relevant and you can get them on that link you can get them on the footer of my site right there but in the meantime i'm happy to take questions thank you hannah really really insightful i think thank for you. like a marketer who is just going to start it's it's like a really great guideline to to begin with thank but you. Uh, how much uh, do you have like so, some kind of uh, tests how much have the results been improved after, well, before you st stepped in and after you did all this, uh, like what you described was like essential things to do for an e-shop? So it's a great question. And the answer is a bit more complicated because every brand is so different. You know how you have some brands that are very high-end brands and they sell very high-end products, expensive products. And then you have some brands that are very, very, um, I like to sell a bunch of different products that have very that are, are, are low priced and every brand has their own different place in the market so it's very hard to see like and especially when i work with clients i'll never promise them a specific result because it's hard to know it's based on so many variables i do know that when we when you do when you have emails that are based on what i spoke about now emails that are strategic thought out well delivered then your conversion rate is bound to go up. Can I say about how much? It's hard to say. And I also think that anyone who does give you a basic, like a, who promises you specific results is not, it's not such a smart idea because you can never really know there's so much else going on. But I do know that having strategic conversion focused emails is bound to lift your conversion rate. Okay. Uh, do you, uh, our previous presenter was uh, talking about AI and how to like do text with, AI to text better with AI. Do you also use AI, use AI in your work? I love that question. I think that's like the question that everyone's discussing nowadays, right? So I actually do use AI. I love using AI. Um, the way I use it is a lot of research. So I, I actually like mentioned a little bit of doing research in my presentation, but before any pre before any uh, campaign that you write, you need to do research to know who you're talking to, to know what your uh, customer pain points are to know 
why they're interested in your products. So I often use AI as a research tool. I'll ask them, you know, pretend you're this and this person um, doing this and this, you know, I'll describe the target market. Why would you want this product? Or why would you hesitate before buying it? Or I'll ask them all the questions that I actually ask real life people. But AI is just easier and quicker and simpler sometimes. So I'll get like basic preliminary research done from that. And I find that if you use the prompts, if you input the prompts really well and you, you know, really set the stage for the prompt, for the, for the, for the AI tool, you can get really good results. And I just, I like seeing all that and, and getting all those results to help me then further write emails. That, that's sometimes really useful, yeah. That's how I use it. Isn't it like creepy how much we are dependent it's on crazy. AI? <laughs> it's crazy. And now that I'm using it so much, I can't imagine how I managed without it before. I mean, I did it by speaking to actual real people, but it's, and I still like to speak to real people, real customers to get an idea. But it's just much simpler, you know, less um, relying on other people. So I, I, it's good. Okay. We have a question also from the audience. Have you tried adding SMSs uh, or texts to abandoned card sequences? Does it improve also something or? That's a great question. And yes, SMS is important. SMS is trickier because SMS somehow feels more, um, so. people are less, uh, more reluctant to part with their number. Whereas they're going to be easier to give you their email than they're going to, they'll be easier. They'll want to give you the email address quicker than they're going to want to give you their, their mobile number. But if you do have mobile numbers, if you do have a way to opt that in, then yes, doing omni-channel marketing is great. It's again, it's, I, I've, I've definitely done that with brands and it's definitely a great marketing technique. It's just the way you use it is like conversation for a whole new presentation, like how you use it alongside. But yeah, definitely it's a great tool to use. Okay. And another question from the audience, uh, uh, the length of the new subscriber sequence, does it like have any effects? How long is it? It, it is the, you had like an example, but is it maybe it's sometimes shorter or longer? Does it make any difference? Okay. So really again, the answer is going to be a dependent. I think it's the most hated answer, but yeah, that's really the answer. I will say that often the it's, <laughs> Like I said in the presentation, when someone has opted in for a welcome sequence, they want to actually hear from you. And now is your chance to tell them more about you. So I don't really, I don't ever think there's a case for making it super short, two to three emails is a waste. It's a shame. They opted in, you might as well give them more. And you sometimes have welcome sequences going on for like 13, 14, 15 emails. And it doesn't necessarily feel like a sequence. It's just an email that drips into your email system, into your account every two, three days, as long as you don't obviously do it all in, in the space of a week, as long as it's dripped out to a manageable extent, then it's fine. Um, so I do think that obviously you have to look at your brand and see what you're selling and see what people want to hear from you. Um, but I do think that there's a case for making it as long as you, as you think your subscribers can handle and as long as strategically makes sense. Too short is not a good idea. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think if I, I'm a, like an e-commerce in, I have a small e shop, for example, and uh, I don't have much resources. I am basically building uh, everything on my own at first. What would be your suggestion I would uh, do uh, at first, like the basic hygiene? What is the like, like the first thing, first thing that you would suggest me to do? Abandoned cart, or is it something like a, something else? Good question. So, really, the title of my of my uh, presentation is really the three main ecom emails mm -hmm. uh, sequences that every brand needs to have. Mm -hmm. And I think really there isn't a case that a brand shouldn't have these three sequences. They should have every single these three sequences. But that said, you can still do it very scrappy. Like a brand can do it without design. Maybe design is important, but you can do it without design. You just need a Clavio um, account, and you can do it without design. Just you know, sit down and write what you think your your, your subscribers need to hear. And you can do all three emails by just writing them into your, as long as you have a Clavio account, you can just, you know, sit down, strategically think about what email, what has to go in every single email, and then write the, each of, just spend the time to write out the sequences. And also the thing about emails is, the good thing about it is that it's really, you know, it's test and go. It's not like you put up a site and then you have to work hard to straight change the structure, to change things, especially when you're not doing design-based emails, it's so easy to like, you know, test, go, see how it goes, change, adapt. And even like based on subscriber feedback, you see how that goes as well. That's the good part about emails, yeah. Okay. Uh, how much does design affect uh, the results? Do you have any like 
uh, examples about about this also so it's interesting that you're asking because it's a very wide ranging topic and you have some marketers who say that design is not necessary and you have some that say it is necessary i think that yes it's necessary especially when you're showcasing products um because people want to actually see what they're buying right it's not helpful for me to tell you about this you know lovely pair of shoes you want to actually see what you're buying so design is important and you do want to have design if you can afford it and when you can afford it um that said there is a case to be made for certain times where where you can go with a completely text-based email and it comes across as being really like written like i said in my in my session person to person when i'm sending a design email it's not obviously it you know it, it serves the purpose of an e-commerce email but it's clearly not a written email from one to the other Whereas when I send you a completely plain text email, then it could really come across as an email from me to you. So, for example, I recommend brands a lot to do this, that when they're sending in the welcome sequence, when they're sending an uh, email from the CEO, they should do that completely plain text. Because, again, it feels a lot more personal, a lot more one-to-one. Um, -one. So, really, it's more about, like, when you want to have that personal one-to-one -one feeling, go with plain text. And when you want to have, you know, you want to showcase your products, you want to do that, then you can go with design version. That makes sense? Yeah. yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah, actually, this was like what I wanted to ask afterwards because in LinkedIn you are seeing lots of lots of arguments about that. That yeah, one part is actually like the plain text email is must be. So and the others are <clears throat> exact opposite. That no, you have to have the design your idea that if you want to have this personal touch send the plain text and when you show that yeah. product, and this is absolutely great because i <clears throat> sometimes also asking there and i'm asking that all right guys but if i want to show as you said like pink uh, stilettos or whatever what i will write there that okay mm -hmm. Now we have nice new pink stilettos, and the spike will be like with sparkles. I don't think that this will work actually. Right, right, 100%. I agree with you on that. Okay, all right. Yeah. I think we don't have any more questions. Thank you, mate, very much mm -hmm. for your time. Thank you. So nice to be here to present and to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. Very, very interesting and insightful. and the if everyone has questions, we will share your slides later and they can contact you. That's directly. great. That's perfect. Good. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.